Have a seat. We'll jump back into some more worship in a little bit. But um, by the way, uh, yes, the answer to your question is that is my wife up there singing uh, the most beautiful voice that there is. And yes, the answer you're thinking to yourself is how in the world did that guy get her? The answer is yes, I'm very lucky. So um, I just want to kind of answer those questions in your mind that I know are just brewing and and going on. Hey, tonight what I wanted to do with you is I just wanted to actually move this out of the way a little bit because it doesn't get in my way. What I wanted to do is I just wanted to kind of take you on a small little journey. I want to take you first or uh, eventually into a room in which Jesus had a meal with his disciples. But to get there, I want to take you on a couple different sections of scripture, kind of do a little survey of some of the Old Testament texts that help us illumine and understand what's taking place on this familiar meal that we all talk about in the Christian world and that we observe in our church once a month called the Lord's Supper. Now, if you're not familiar with what the Lord's Supper is, you've probably read the Da Vinci Code, and so you're probably at least somewhat aware of the term, right? Uh, so the, the, the Lord's Supper is all about that night when Jesus sat down with his disciples for the final meal before his eventual crucifixion that same night. But before we actually jump into that scene in Matthew chapter 26, I want to start us off with understanding a couple other Old Testament texts. Because what is going on in that scene in Matthew chapter 26 was taking place in all of that conversation that Jesus has with the disciples is rooted in, in some deep, deep history. And that history starts with something called the Passover, which if you recall, those of you who are Bible students, you recall that that's when God uh, had the final plague on the Egyptians, which was the angel of death coming through and killing all the firstborn in Egypt. Now, Israel was slaves to Egypt, and so God told them, you take a lamb, you kill it, and you put the blood on its doorpost, right? And that will be the symbol that the angel of death will pass over your house, and no one in your house will die. Your firstborn child, your firstborn oxen, your firstborn lamb, whatever it may be, everyone is safe. Well, clearly the Israelites got the memo, and the, the Egyptians didn't. Because of that event, the Israelites were not only just released from, from Egypt, they were actually ushered out. They were, they looted Egypt. They gave them their gold. They gave them their cattle. They gave them their money. They gave them things to have them go. God did an amazing work. And that Passover feast or that Passover meal is something that God told Israel year in and year out, you are to observe, to remember the deliverance I did on your behalf, the deliverance I did because of my mercy toward you. But there's another scene. There's another event tied into that one exodus that is also important to understanding in this Passover meal. And I want to turn there with you. You have your Bibles. You can turn if you want. I have it on the screen for those who don't bring your Bibles, which is me tonight. Exodus 24, the scene in chapter 19, Israel is camping at Mount Sinai. Chapter 20, they get the Ten Commandments. In chapter 20 through 23, they're getting all kinds of other case laws, slavery laws, uh, uh, social laws, all of those things. And it climaxes in this statement right here in Exodus chapter 24. Moses then took the book of the covenant, which is really, if you want to do some checking on this, Exodus chapter 20 to 23, they're reading those chapters, and then he says this, and in the hearing of the people, and he said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. It sounds a lot like a wedding ceremony, right? Do you? I do. Do you? I do. Okay, right? There's a covenant being made. All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. We will be obedient. Those are famous last words, aren't they? Moses took the blood of the oxen. There had already been some animals slaughtered. He then takes the blood of that oxen, which in the Old Testament, the, the Israelite culture, there's gradations of animals, sheep and doves. And, but oxen, that was the big animal. That was the one that was killed when you're dealing with the community element. So the oxen is killed because that's the most important animal. And his blood is thrown on the people. Moses takes the blood and he sprinkles the people. There's a lot of people. So there's got to be a lot of blood to sprinkle them with. And behold, he said, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with these words. Now, who are the speakers here? Well, one, we might say there's God through Moses, right, in the book of the covenant. But two is these words includes the people. We will do all the Lord requires. We will be obedient. 
And I also want you to notice the nature of the blood, the animals, right? The oxen. This is a this is a covenant being established between God and man, and what's taking place here is that God is making a covenant to them, and they, in response, are making a covenant to him, saying, we will do everything you say. We will obey, and the symbol for that, then, is this blood of an oxen being sprinkled on them. Now, you'll keep in mind that from that point forward, whenever there was a sin, that whenever there was a transgression that took place, what kind of blood was used to pay for that sin? an animal, right? This was a covenant established in the blood of animals. Now, one of the things you're going to see here, or you're going to not hear, is the fact that there is no mention about forgiveness of sins. But this is picked up, and this is hit on, many centuries later, in a time when Israel has transgressed the law and failed to obey and uphold their end of the deal. And the prophet Jeremiah, after they have gone into exile, he is lamenting and he is talking and he is warning. And he then promises Israel that there will come another day when there will be a new and better covenant. And this is what he says. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Now, this is going back to that Exodus chapter 24 passage at Mount Sinai. It won't be like that one. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord, though I was an intimate caretaker of them. He goes on. For this is the covenant that I will make, looking forward to the future. With the house of Israel, after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Let me ask you a question. How many people are talking here? There's just one. This is what God says he will do. What he will do with regards to the law, nobody is saying they're going to obey it. He's saying, I'm going to do something with that. I'm going to put it inside their hearts. I'm going to put it inside of them so it'll be something that they themselves will be desiring to do. I will implant it in their hearts. And then he says, as a phrase, for I will forgive their iniquity and I'll remember their sin no more. Which makes you kind of wonder, was there forgiveness in the Old Testament? Yes, in a sense, but no, in a sense. Yes, in a sense, in which there was forgiveness, but that forgiveness was simply that the debt was passed over for a future date. No, in the sense, in which the sin was really dealt with. The sin hadn't been dealt with. It had simply been passed over, like that credit card you passed, right? You swipe it through the machine, and you paid your bill, at least to the restaurant. You paid your bill, at least to the car dealership, right? But the bill's not paid yet. The dealership's happy. The restaurant's happy, right? You get out there without washing dishes, but the bill's not paid, right? See, the debt was forgiven, but it's more or less overlooked till a future time. And you know when that bill comes in the mail, right? There's the future time, must be paid in full, right? Here we have here on that day, in that future time with that new covenant, something's going to happen in which not only will there be forgiveness, which is passed over, it's going to be forgiven because it will be forgotten. It will have been dealt with completely. Because there's only one party speaking here. There's only one party speaking here, and that's God. As opposed to before, there was two making the covenant. Now, let's jump forward now to Matthew 26. This is our upper room scene. This is the Last Supper in which Matthew's describing what takes place, and here's his words. Now as Jesus and his disciples were eating this Passover feast in Jerusalem, the night he was going to be betrayed and eventually crucified, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. For this is, here's that phrase again, my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many 
for the forgiveness of sins. Question, how many people are speaking here? Just one. Whose blood or what kind of blood is being used to seal the covenant? It's his blood. What are the disciples doing in this room while he's speaking? They're listening. And you know what their action is? They take the cup and they drink the cup. They made no promises back to Jesus. They made no promise saying, whatever you say, we got it, we're going to do it, we've got it down. Right? Are you noticing this? One person speaking, because this is a covenant that was foreshadowed in Jeremiah that would be better than the one talked about in Exodus, because one that is built upon the absolute mercy of God. This is a relationship built on the mercy of God. You and I have entered into a relationship with him if we are in Christ, and it is based on his mercy. That's why I gave you these name tags if you have one. You and I are forever objects of mercy. That's the relationship that we have with him. Now, that's a little bit uh, offensive to some people. I mean, to be honest, nobody wants to be seen as like somebody's uh, object of mercy. Oh, we're just nice to them because we're merciful and stuff. That just kind of sounds a little bit, you know, de demoralizing and demeaning and stuff. No, no, I want to pull myself up by my own bootstraps. I'm going to present my resume to God, and it's going to look good. Right? That's, that's sort of how we go about it. And so this idea of being, being an object of mercy is very offensive to us in our culture. That's what makes the cross so offensive. It says, basically, you don't have what it takes to be acceptable before God. You can't keep your end of the deal. You say, I will, and the next day you're saying, I'm sorry. You say, okay, and then pretty soon saying, can we just adjust what we just said there a little bit? Can we go back and revisit that? I would love to adjust the conditions of what we agreed to. How many of us have ever said, God, if you will forgive me this one time, I will never do it again? Usually that lasts within a good week until you're saying, oh goodness, I did it again, right? And that's what makes this covenant so, so important is that it's based upon the mercy of God. Now, in Romans, we're in a series right now together, this church in the book of Romans. And we're going to be there for a long time, but we'll get to chapter 12 eventually. But in chapter 12, Paul moves in this whole conversation all about the doctrine and the, 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 the explanation, the theology of mercy, of God's mercy to us, and then he moves into duty. He moves into the life. He moves into the, the posture of obedience, the posture of living it out. But I want you to see how he connects those two dots. He says, therefore... In view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual worship. That therefore is important because it implies that you and I, all that we do, the nature of our relationship is built on the deep, deep foundation, the deep, deep soil and rich soil of God's mercy. So before you move out into this life of obedience, you first have to be secure and confident that God will continually be merciful to you, that God's mercy doesn't run out, that God will keep giving more because it was a covenant sealed not with the blood of animals that really has lower value than you do. It was a sealed by the incarnate second person of the Trinity. It was sealed by his. And Jesus at that table is basically saying, this is going to cost me an awful lot. Mercy always costs. Mercy is always expensive to somebody because it means you've got to absorb the wound. You've got to absorb the debt. You've got to take the hit. And Jesus is basically saying, guys, this is going to cost me dearly. Those words had got to be ringing in their ears as they saw Jesus hanging on the cross. This covenant cost him dearly. Now, in a few, two weeks from now, on Sunday morning, you can join us back here. We're going to talk about the extent of what that cost looked like. Because it wasn't just the fact that he felt the pain of the cross. It was much, much deeper than that. But I'll let you come back on Sunday in two weeks, uh, April 12th. You can hear all about it then. Put it back on the screen. So I want you to see this. 
He says then, verse 2 of Romans 12, do not be conformed to this world. Don't be conformed to it, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What in the world do we renew our minds with? The mercy of God. Right? That, that is what the Christian, that is what you and I are constantly renewing our The mercy of God. At the cross. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Don't be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. How? As you meditate, as you reflect, as you internalize and chew on and enjoy the deep, deep soil of God's mercy. Have you ever noticed in the Gospels the people who were most attracted to Jesus were the ones who recognized they needed mercy? Jesus is only attracted to those who understand their need for mercy. If you in any way feel like, well, I'm doing okay. My life is going pretty good. Jesus well, might be a good teacher at some point, but his, the words he says about you need me to be your everything will sound repulsive to you. It sounded repulsive to the Pharisees in the, in the scriptures, to all the people in the religious system who were doing all the things they could Jesus was not attracted, but to the people who are called sinners and prostitutes and tax collectors, all those who are on the outskirts, those people Jesus dined with, he sat with, and they enjoyed him. You ever notice that? Because the only people who are attracted to him are those who are the sinners. So, what does this mean? The fact that you and I are in relationship with him because of mercy, it means two things. You don't need to jot these down, just put them in your mind. First, it means that you're in a very, very stable and very, very safe relationship. Isn't it nice to know that somebody knows everything about you? Isn't it nice to know? Now, let me qualify this. It's nice to know it if they love you. It's nice to know it if they're not going to use it against you. It's nice to know it if that person has committed themselves not only to you, but has given their very life for that. See, I know that a lot of us are in our best posture here, right? I mean, I got dressed up for you tonight. My wife sees me uh, in my pajamas and just whatever else. But you guys, you guys get the best, right? And I can look, put on a pretty good show up here, and you guys can put on a pretty good show to me also. I mean, you look pretty darn good. And I'm guessing your Facebook profile is pretty up to date, right? You don't put pictures on there of when you wake up in the morning. You put pictures on there of after you've done your hair and put on your deodorant and got your things. And then you, and then you sort through the 15 pictures you have and go, which one looks the best? And that one I'll put on there, right? We put a lot of time and attention to maintaining our appearance. And in some ways, we would be, we, we would be frustrated if somebody got a hold of all of those other photos that we nixed, right? Isn't it nice to know that Jesus says to you, I not only know the bad you're willing to show, I know the bad you are unwilling to show. I knew every single thing about you. And guess what? I love you. Now, this is a different kind of love than a sentimental, I can't believe this person is the best thing in the whole world kind of love that a guy says to a girl when he's in, you know, starry-eyed and stuff. You know when that happens, right? In high school, when you just look at a girl or a girl at a guy and says, oh my gosh, he or she is the best thing ever. They are beautiful and they have the best personality and there's so much fun about them, right? And I am so in love. It's a different kind of love than that when he says it. It says, no, no, this person is awkward, this person is ugly, this person is not desirable, but I'm going to love him because that's the kind of God that I am. And that's hard to take because I don't want to be the one that says, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't have much to offer this relationship here. I'm not very desirable. I'm not very lovely. See, but when you enter in this relationship, you know that there's stability there because mercy is the most resilient thing there is. Because mercy implies that everything about you is already known and he says, I have died for you. 
for all of that. I know a lot of us go into our dark areas of our sin. We go into those closets, I call them, in which we're saying, I don't want the world to see this part of me, and I'm going to go in, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what I do in there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be the person I am in there, and the world will never see. And I'm God, I know you know about it, but I want you to stay out here. And he says, absolutely not. I am going in with you because I'm committed to you even in that moment. I love you in that moment, not after the fact when you say, I'm sorry, but in the moment in which you are at your ugliest, when you are committing the worst sin that you can think of in your life, he is saying, in that moment, I love you because I hung on the cross for you for that moment and I walk into that closet with you and I stand there while you're doing it and I say over and over, I am committed to you and I love you because this is a relationship built upon mercy, a foundation of mercy. I think a lot of us lose the wonder of our walk with the Lord because we forget the wonder of the cross. We forget the wonder of his mercy. Wow. God, you love me even in my bad. Not after I say I'm sorry. Not when I'm doing better because I have enough space and time between that. You love me in the very moment of that action. You love me as I'm saying those hurtful words. You love me when I'm doing that hurtful thing. You love me and you're committed to me and are going nowhere because I know because of the cross, neither height nor depth nor angels nor powers nor anything in all creation can separate me from your love that there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ because I am in a relationship founded upon mercy. You are in a very safe and a very stable relationship. And number two, and this will be built on this Sunday, come back to there then, so let me hit it briefly. The second thing is that if you are trying to relate to God in any other way, then you don't really understand the cross. You don't understand his nature, and you're not relating to him as he is. Men and women, when Jesus came down, took on flesh, lived the life that we could not live, went to the cross and paid the price we could not pay. He was announcing something to you about who he is and for you to disregard that action, say, I'll do it on my own, is for you to say, I don't really want that part of who God is. I want a different God. You don't really understand him if you don't relate to him on the foundation of mercy. That's what it means. So tonight is what we want to do. The room has candles. It has some tables. has communion around. We're going we're to reenact this Lord's Supper, right? At that supper, we might call it the Mercy Supper, where Jesus instituted this relationship, this covenant with his disciples and those following in this area of mercy. Well, there's tables here. And during the next 20 minutes, we're going to just be singing. That's 20 minutes of song, 20 minutes of singing. You can sing. You can sit there, but I want to encourage you at some point throughout the night, find your way to a table. Pick up that bread and recognize this was representative of the body that was broken for you. Pick up that cup and recognize this is the blood poured out for me. Now, we at this church believe that God has created us physical and spiritual. And because of that, what we do with our bodies matter. We would like to think that, Lord, I can just sit in my seat and do nothing and just reflect on you. And you can do that, but in many ways, what you do with your body is important. And so that's where we say, get up and partake in the meal. There's also a cross in the back. Maybe you need to go to the back and actually kneel before the cross, say, Jesus, I need to reclaim your mercy. There's sin that's been harboring, and I need to just receive your mercy. I need to meditate on the fact that I am loved in my bad. I need to remember the fact that even in my worst situation, I am deeply, deeply loved. Because the person who tries to do it off of Exodus 24, in which, oh, I'll be obedient next time, I'll do it next time, is the person who will never, ever grasp the depth and the love or width and the height and the breadth of God's love. And someone who will stay spiritually immature because you will never dive into the depths of what God has done for you. 
See, once you realize that his mercy is that big, you are now in a safe environment to go deeper into your own heart. Say, you know what? There's some parts about me that I don't even want to deal with. There's some parts about me that I don't even like and I don't want to bring up, but I'm going to allow God, because you're safe, I'm going to allow you to start bringing those areas up. Bring up the the social acceptable sins of pride and, and greed and gluttony and all those things. I, I'm, those are s- disgusting. Lust. I want to bring those up and let you see that, God, and confess that to you. And not only just confess to walk away, but confess to say, this, in this moment, God, I receive your love for me. See, before you confess and move on, confess and receive. Before you say, I'm going to not do it anymore, say, stop it. No, no, this is who I am. And Father, you love me right now. Jesus, you love me right now. That's how you renew your mind. That that's how you start moving toward the life God has called you to because you're allowing him to implant his law in your heart, the law based upon his love. So use this time. Use the cross. Use the tables. Pray with each other. Get on your knees. Stand up. Raise your hand. Use your bodies to express to God what he's doing in your hearts. God, we thank you that you are in love with us. But it's not the kind of love that is sentimental in which there's a, man, I can't get over that person. They're the best thing since sliced bread. No, it's the kind of love that says even though There is nothing desirable in them. I choose to because of my nature. I am that kind of God. I choose to be faithfully loving, faithfully committed to them because my son paid for that price of their sin and I forget it and I remember it no more. So Father, that's, that's your invitation to us as your people who are bought by the blood of Christ. And we thank you so much for that. And in Christ's name we pray, amen.